Good day and welcome to JCC Sunday Schools in Session, where Sunday School matters to God. Please like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. We would love for you to be a part of the JCC family. Our Sunday School lesson today is titled, The Crucifixion of Jesus, and it's coming from Luke chapter 23, verses 33 through 49. Now, the significance of Christ's crucifixion cannot be overstated even this day. Yes, Jesus was the Son of God who died on the cross for all of our sins. This week's lesson is an opportunity for us to look at this here and ponder and understand why God did what God did. Let's get into the lesson and see what it has to offer us today. We're going to begin reading verses 33 through 38. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, they were crucified him. There they crucified him. And the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiments and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save yourself. And the superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and in Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Now, Calvary is the name of the place where Jesus Christ was crucified. And Calvary, that name means the skull. And this is thought to refer to the shape or the appearance of the hill in which Jesus Christ was crucified. But Calvary itself represents death and sin. It's a place where the judgment happens, both in the natural and now in Jesus Christ's case, the supernatural. So Calvary was a place where divine love met sinful man. Were it not for the place and the death of the cross of Calvary, we all will be hopelessly lost and helpless to get to God and get to heaven. Yes, Calvary was a place where God's amazing grace was shown to all who would accept it by faith. The finished work of Jesus Christ was done right there on Calvary. Calvary is the place where sin's price was paid in full. You were bought with the price. That very price that Jesus Christ paid for all of us to have a right back to the tree of God. Yes, Calvary is the place where Satan was defeated. God promised Satan in Genesis 3 and 15 that her seed, her offspring, would bruise his head. And it was on Calvary at that place where Jesus Christ bruised the head of Satan. And finally, we are shown that Calvary is the place where man's destiny is determined. Let me say that again. It's because of Calvary that we now know our destiny can be determined as we look to be with God. To God be the glory. Yes, it's Calvary that we see that God used the most terrible place to die, the most cruel and inhumane way to die, God used it to judge the sins of the world. But our text says that also there were two criminals placed between them. He died for them just as much as he died for us. He died for all mankind because we fell short of the glory of God. Yes, we have all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Question one is, how did Jesus practice what he preached even when hanging on the cross? Jesus had taught his disciples to love their enemies and pray for those who treated them badly. And in this most severe condition, Jesus shows us not only does he preach it, but he practiced what he preaches. He asked God to forgive all those because they knew not what they were doing. He came to bring forgiveness so that we could have a relationship with God. 
that forgiveness wasn't just for those right there at the cross. I believe that forgiveness was for all of mankind because we didn't know what we were doing out there living sinful lives separated from a just God. Yes, we can see that Christ showed no anger, no hostility towards the enemies, towards the soldiers, towards the rulers, towards even us in this day and time. He showed no hostility. He just humbly uttered words, Lord, forgive them of their sin, for they know not what they do. We need to thank God that Christ is a man that practiced what he preaches, that he was willing to forgive even though he committed no sins as he took our sins to the cross. Question two says, how did the Jewish ruler mock Jesus claim that he was a promised Messiah? They were mocking uh, him uh, by saying, that if you are the Messiah, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you're the Messiah. The Bible says to us that men love the darkness rather than the light, for the deeds were evil. And brothers and sisters, this here mockery was evil. It was a dark moment. It was darkness here being personified as they go in and begin to make these here accusations of Jesus Christ. See, this mocking was meant to tear him down, not to build him up. The religious system back then was trying to tear him down. But today we need to take the righteousness of God and learn to reach down and build people up. We need to extend a helping hand, but no hand was extended by this, these leaders back then, we need to change the course and extend a hand to help a man when he's down. They chose to mock Jesus. Question three says, how did the soldiers' action show a disregard for Christ? The soldiers had already demonstrated a disregard for Christ by casting lots for his clothes. They had heard the Jewish leaders mock Christ, so they began to join in as well. They ridiculed and scoffed him. They began to talk down on him as well. And this is the sad part, is they first saw it, his own people mock him. And as a result, they began to join in with the crowd as well. See, the lesson is that many people ridicule because the church ridicules. The church doesn't stand for the things it needs to stand for. So they, as we are silent, people begin to mock as well. And sometimes mockery comes from our own walls as well. The people of God must always be the example and not part of the problem. We have to never follow the crowd because wide is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the road that leads to heaven. We need to be on the road that leads to heaven and demonstrate to others the right things to do. Question four is, how did Pilate speak more truthfully than he intended about Jesus. Pilate used and made a, a subscription and put it on a plaque that was hung before Jesus. It was in three different languages. But in each of those languages, it said Jesus was the king of the Jews. Now, again, he may have intended this to be mockery as well, but he didn't realize that God was using him to still push forth his plan. See, just as Caesar Augustus was God's tool to assure that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Pilate was God's means to testify to the world about Jesus, who he truly was, that he was the king of the world. Verses 39 through 43 read, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God? seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now, question five is what people ridicule Jesus at the cross? Again, we know the rulers uh, were, were part of the market. We know the soldiers did it. But even the man on the cross ridiculed Jesus as well. That he began to 
kick at and and talk and and and, and tell Jesus if you're gonna save yourself, save yourself and us too. But he didn't seek salvation. He went along with the crowd. And brothers and sisters, it's never good to follow the crowd. Those who live apart from God choose to die apart from him as well. So we see that he did not fear God. He didn't care. He was worried about himself. He was looking out only for himself. and said, if you're going to save yourself, save you and me as well. But question six is, how did Jesus extend grace to the second criminal? Jesus told him that he would be with him in paradise. Why? Because the second criminal rebuked the first one and asked, don't you fear God? He says, we deserve what we're getting. We deserve the reward due our deeds. But this man done nothing. But notice what he does next. He turns to Jesus and asks for forgiveness. He didn't physically ask for it, but he, in his words, he had an implication that he wanted to be forgiven. He just asked Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, surely I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. See, grace was extended because of repentance and faith. We're saved by grace through faith. This is our gift from God. And this man received that gift this day. Question seven says, what hope did Jesus relay bring to the repentant criminal? Again, a criminal thinking that the kingdom may have been down the road. Jesus assured him that his kingdom was right now. That as soon as he left this mortal body, that he would be with God in paradise. See, paradise was believed to be a place where the righteous resided after death. And it was that place is in the very presence of God. And we see a, a depiction of it in the Bible when the rich ruler looked up and saw Lazarus up in paradise, up in the presence of God. And he asked Abraham for him to dip his uh, hand in water, to drip some on his tongue. So we believe that those who trust in Christ as their Savior will one day, even after death, be absent from the body and immediately present with the Lord. And that is the paradise that we will enjoy as those who die in Christ. Yes, this promise of Jesus assures that eternal state that we will one day be with him for eternity. But it's only for those who accept him, repent, and make him their Lord and Savior. Those are the ones who will receive eternal life. Now, verses 44 through 49 read, And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the mist. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. All the people that came together to that sight, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. All of his acquaintances and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off, beholding these things. Question 8 says, what miracle did God perform as Jesus hung on the cross? For three hours, darkness fell upon the earth. The sun refused to shine and the veil in the temple was torn in two. The Bible tells us that it was torn from top to bottom. Now, this darkness is considered to be a divine judgment. As Jesus suffered on the cross in this here profound darkness, God's judgment was poured out because of sin. And Jesus was bearing the guilt of the world on himself. He was made sin for all of us, and he received the judgment that we Deserve. Let me say that again. He was made sin so that he can receive the judgment that was for us. He took on the full brunt of the wrath of God for us. I don't need you to remember something about darkness. If you remember God allowed darkness in the ninth plague in Egypt, when God allowed that darkness to cover the land for three days, and it was immediately followed up by the death on that next plague, the tenth plague, 
by the firstborn son of Egypt dying. Only those who had the bloodstained banner of the lamb, that Passover lamb, lived. This darkness at Calvary for these three hours was immediately followed up by the death of the only begotten Son of God, who was our Passover lamb. In order for us to be saved, just like this thief, just like those back in the day with that blood-stained banner on the door, we got to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ as well. We need to repent and be covered with the blood of Christ. It needs to be on our threshold, be on our entryway, be covering us to let the world know that we also belong to God. Then the death angel passes away. Only blood kept the death angel from entering in. Question nine says, what did the tearing of the veil symbolize? When the veil was torn into, it symbolized that the way was open to direct access to God for everybody. Not for a high priest anymore. It didn't require a high priest to go in before God. It shows us that the breach between God and us is no longer there. We can now approach God for ourselves. We don't need a human to go between us. Christ made it so that we can seek God for ourselves. All we need is Christ and the Holy Spirit that grants access to him. If you remember in the tabernacle, when you walked into the holy place, you had the lamp and the uh, table of showbread standing there. Both of those represent the Holy Spirit. One represents the Holy Spirit. One represents Jesus Christ as the bread of life. Now we're able to walk through that entryway into the Holy of Holies to be with our Lord and Savior. To God be the glory. Question 10 says, how did the crowd that witnessed this event respond? Text says they smoked their chest, meaning they beat their breast, which was a typical sign of mourning. They were not necessarily expressing repentance by doing this, but they were demonstrating their grief that was in their heart. Far back in the crowd were those who truly followed God, who followed Jesus Christ, who, who were from uh, Galilee. Their master was now dead. The disciples and the followers see Christ as being dead. And they didn't know what the future held. They watched with heavy hearts, wondering what would come next. And we all know next week, as we get prepared, next week we know what comes. That even though he gave up the ghost, they didn't take it from him. He laid it down. He laid his life down because he told us that just because I lay it down, I will also, I'm able to pick it up. And next week, we know he picks it up. So God be the glory. It's because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, we have hope. We have connection. We have an ability to get back into fellowship with God. Praise be to God. Well, this ends our lesson for this week. I pray you have enjoyed the class. Please hit the thumbs up indicating that you have uh, enjoyed it. Please leave us a comment and subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so already. It also helps when you hit that thumb up button. It helps us to get the message out to more people. Well, I pray that you have been blessed uh, this week as we prepare our hearts and minds for next week. This is the uh, Palm Sunday so we're looking forward to what God is going to do as he enter into the city this week and next week as they carry him out the city uh, and then be risen uh, on that third day. Well, that's all for this. We come back next week. Same time, same channel. Be blessed now.